The Peter Schiff Show. Well, this is another week of generally bad economic data coming out that most people have ignored. You know, the stock market was up again this week. The Dow, I think, closed on a new weekly high for the year 2016. It was up about 1.8 percent on the year. I don't know if the Dow is rising despite the bad news or because of the bad news, because the bad news means the economy is weak and corporate earnings are not going to be there. And you've got high multiples. So uh, disappointing earnings are bad for stocks. But of course, if the economy is weak, that takes the Fed out of the rate hiking game and I think puts it into the rate cutting QE4 game. And of course, that is bullish for stocks. So the market is caught between those opposing forces of cheap money uh, lifting it up but falling earnings on the back of a weakening economy, pushing it down. Gold was actually down on the week, I think about five or six bucks, not a big decline. You know, it started off the week strong, and then Wednesday, it got hit pretty good, and Thursday, rather. Wednesday it went down, and Thursday was a bigger day down. Then today, it recouped some of the losses. But the standout was silver, because silver was up almost 6% on the week. I think 5.7%, 84 cents or so. On the week, this is a new high. Silver closed at the highest close of the year. It's a new high for the move uh, for the price of silver. And in fact, silver was strong with gold on Monday and Tuesday. And then when gold sold off on Wednesday and Thursday, silver really held up. And I thought that was a pretty good sign that we were seeing that kind of strength in silver. And I think that's also a good sign for both gold. You know, I was on uh, CNBC.com, not on uh, the actual television. Again, I was on the the website. And they asked me about gold. And I meant to say something about silver, but I forgot. But, you know, they're not even talking about silver, really, in the mainstream. So I think they're missing an even bigger move. They're acknowledging that gold's going up, but they're not even looking at silver. In fact, I think I mentioned on this one of these podcasts that I noticed or, or I heard that there are a number of people that are shorting silver and buying gold because they saw the breakout to new highs on the gold silver ratio and they wanted to jump on that trade which i thought was the wrong thing to do to me seeing new highs in that ratio in favor of silver made me more want to buy silver uh since it was as cheap as it's ever been relative to gold it wouldn't make me want to short it even more and i know i talked about that on the podcast and i thought look you know, if you like gold, just buy it. Don't 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 short silver because you can turn a winning trade into a losing trade. Because I think if I'm right about a bull market in gold, there's going to be a bull market in silver. I don't think there's ever been a bull market in gold that wasn't accompanied by a bull market in silver. And typically, the silver market does even better in a bull market than gold. But let me go over the economic data that came out during the week, because I think my last podcast was on Monday. And so we didn't get any of this data. On Tuesday... We had the National Federation of Small Business Optimism Index, although maybe they're going to have to rename this index as the Pessimism Index. But last month, we got 92.9. That was the February read. And everybody expected optimism to improve right, to 93.6. They always expect good news, but they never get it. But, you know, hope springs eternal because all the economic data is always anticipated to be good. Well, the number came out at 92.6, which was well below uh, not only what was expected, but the low range of the consensus. The consensus ranged from a low of 93.5 to a high of 93.9. Instead, we got 92.6. So that was the lowest it's been in over two years. And if you read through the survey, the number one concern that small business owners have is the weak U.S. economy. The weak U.S. economy. I thought the U.S. economy is so strong. This it's the strongest economy in in, in the world, according to uh, Barack Obama, or the uh, advanced economy, the strongest advanced economy in the world. Uh, And if it's so strong, why are small business owners so pessimistic? Why are they so worried about the weak economy if the economy is so strong? I mean, did they not get that memo? Right? Was that lost in the mail? Did President Obama forgot to tell? The business owners, how good the economy is, maybe maybe you should let them know because maybe they wouldn't be so worried if, you know, they knew the economy was in better shape. You know, no, I guess, you know, they're peddling fiction here uh, when they are worried about a weak economy that supposedly, I guess, only exists in their mind. You know, they're worried for no reason Now you would think these guys are like the ground troops 
They're they're running the small businesses, the backbone of the economy. And if from their perspective, the economy is weak, you know, to me, that's a lot more telling than what Janet Yellen says or what President Obama says. And of course, obviously, they have a vested interest in pretending the economy is strong because Hillary Clinton can't get reelected if the economy isn't strong because she, you know, she's four more years. I mean, you watch those debates last night between Hillary and, and Sanders. I mean, all she's doing is defending Obama. She's talking about how great Obama is. She has totally wrapped herself up in, in Obama wrapping, right? I mean, so she's all about a third term for President Obama. So she's, no one's going to want a third term if they realize that we're back in recession at the end of the second term. Who wants to sign up for more years of that? And so everybody has to pretend that the economy is good. But these small business owners... They know it's lousy because they're trying to operate a small business and they see all the problems from the ground floor. But here's some information that came out on Wednesday. And even before I tell you this information, the Atlanta Fed on Wednesday, shortly after this economic news I'm I'm about to go over was released, they came out and actually revised upwards, upwards, their forecast for the first quarter of GDP from 0.1% to point three. Now, point three is nothing to get excited about, but they did notch it up. And I was expecting them to go negative based on the economic data that came out before they decided to notch it up, which made no sense, which to me, it looked very, very politically motivated. Maybe the Atlanta Fed was afraid to have a forecast for a negative GDP for the first quarter. So maybe they felt some pressure or maybe it was from the New York Fed that just has its own GDP tracker out now, which is, you know, much higher than the Atlanta Fed. So maybe there is a lot of politics involved because it doesn't make any sense, especially when I I tell you what these numbers are. So we got the retail sales numbers and retail sales. This is a big part of the GDP because it's, you know, consumer spending. Well, they were looking for up point one. And instead of up 0.1, we got down 0.3. So that's a pretty big difference. Now, they did slightly revise last month's minus 0.1 to zero. But when you take the two months combined of a zero and a minus 0.3 and a minus 0.1 and an up 0.1, the new numbers are much weaker than the original numbers. The original numbers were the ones the Atlanta Fed was working with when they came up with a 0.1 GDP for the first quarter. Now they know that retail sales are lower than they thought. Same thing on X autos. They were looking for up 0.4 and they only got up 0.2. But they did revise the prior month from minus 0.1 to zero. But still, when you add them all together, the current month, the March month, was more weaker than the February month was made stronger. So these numbers, if anything, should have made the Atlanta Fed more pessimistic about first quarter GDP growth, and it should have caused them to want to revise down their numbers. But even more important were the inventory numbers. Inventory for February. We don't even have March yet. March, I think, is going to be a really bad number. We don't even have that one yet. But the January number was originally reported as up 0.1. And they were expecting a down 0.1 for February. Well, we got down 0.1 for February, but they revised the January number from up 0.1 to down 0.1. So that means this down 0.1 is really like a down 0.3, right? Because of the revisions. So this means that inventory is going to subtract more from the first quarter GDP than you would have originally assumed based on the inventory data that we had prior to this release. So that's why I was so surprised that after these two negative numbers came out that would both subtract from anybody's estimate of first quarter GDP, and then within an hour of this information coming out, the Atlanta Fed comes out and says, oh, now we think GDP in the first quarter is going to be 0.3 instead of 0.1. Why would you do that? It makes no sense. If you were at point one before this Bay of data, and this is really the only data that's come out since their last uh, estimate. So if you were at point one and now you got worse data than you thought, why would you go up to point three? Why would you go down to minus point one or minus point two? I think there is a lot of politics uh, behind, behind this number.
But that wasn't the last bad economic news that we got on the week, because today we got some more news, some significant news that I think should weigh on GDP. We got the industrial production numbers for March. And here, once again, we get news that's worse than expected, and then we downwardly revise the bad news from the prior month. So the February number for industrial production was originally reported as minus 0.5, which was a bad number. And they made it worse to minus 0.6. This month, it was supposed to be minus 0.1. And we got minus 0.6. So now we got minus 0.6 in March, and we got minus 0.6 in, in February. And year over year, these numbers are atrocious. I mean, these year-over-year -year declines, we've never seen anything like these consecutive year-over-year -year declines in industrial production uh, unless we were in a recession. This never happens outside a recession. In fact, one of the scariest numbers was capacity utilization. Last month, it was reported that our factories were utilizing capacity at 76.7%. Well, they revised that down to 75.3 from uh, February. March was supposed to come in at 754 Instead, it came in all the way down at 74.8. So this, again, is more evidence of recession. Uh, production is down. Look, we got the uh, Baker Huge oil rig, rig count down again. Every week it goes down. It was down another, I think, four rigs or three rigs this week. It's the lowest it's been since the fourth quarter of 2009. It is just going straight, straight down. So all this is uh, dragging down the economy. And we also got a consumer confidence number we got consumer sentiment for april so now this is now we're into the second quarter but it's a consumer sentiment index and last month was 91 and you know typical they were looking for an improvement they were looking for consumer sentiment to pop up to 91.8 why i don't know i don't know what they think uh people should be optimistic about but the people that you know that are trying to handicap these reports are very optimistic, I guess. So they just assume that the public is. So they were looking for 91.8. Instead, the index went down to 89.7. So it's not even, it's below 90. The whole consensus range, the lowest number anybody had on Wall Street was 90. And the highest was 94.2. So that was the range. The middle of that range was 91.8. And again, we disappoint even the lower end. We come in lower than the lowest ex that anybody expected at 89.7. Yet again, everybody continues to talk about the economy as if it's recovering. When all of the data shows clearly that it's relapsing back into recession if it's not already in recession. Also, if you look at the political indicators, and I've talked about this before, the newest polls that just came out today show that Bernie Sanders is almost tied with Hillary Clinton in the national polls. This is the highest he's been. They're about two points away from each other. And you're talking about a self-described, self-professed socialist. Right? And I, I watched this debate. He basically is the personification of every ridiculous you know, liberal uh, position on any issue, he's he's got them all, right? I mean, he hits every one of these talking points right down to, you know, we, we've got to save the, the world from this massive climate change. We need a carbon tax. We need a $15 minimum wage. We need uh, free health insurance for everybody or socialized health insurance, free college. We got to mandate a family leave and medical leave. And mater all, I mean, every everything that liberals talk about this guy is is championing every one of these crazy causes, and he's right up there. I mean, Hillary Clinton obviously is not a great candidate, but the fact that uh, Bernie Sanders can come from almost obscurity. I mean, nobody even knew who this guy was. I mean, I knew who he was, but I mean, I mean, the average American who's who's supporting him now had no idea that this guy even existed until uh, until recently. And, you know, there's still, you know, he's Jewish. I mean, you know. There's probably still a lot of anti-Semitism out there, you know, uh, yet here's this Jew, uh, New England Jew, New York Jew, uh, and yet, you know, he's basically tied with uh, with Hillary Clinton, uh, and he's beating her. I mean, if again, if I said it, if it wasn't for the African-American vote, the Latino vote, he'd win the landslide. 
Why is he so popular? He's so popular for the same reason that small business owners are so pessimistic because the economy is lousy. The same thing on the Republican side. Donald Trump, in the same polls, he is now leading by his biggest margin yet, yet in the national polls. He is way out ahead of Cruz. He's way ahead of Kasich. He has never been this far ahead. And why is that? Because you know, you've got the candidates that represent the most extreme of the the economy stinks and we need something different, right? If you really think the economy is lousy and you don't think that the Republicans or the Democrats are going to solve your problems because they haven't done in the past. If you are a discouraged Democrat, Bernie Sanders is your candidate, right? Because he's different. I mean, he's he's different in that he's even more extreme. The things that he's uh, that he is advocating are even crazier than the things that your typical Democrat uh, advocates. But if you're a frustrated Democrat and you believe all this nonsense because the economy is really lousy and you know, look, Barack Obama has been your president for eight years. And when he became president, all these Bernie Sanders voters were so optimistic, so enthusiastic about President Obama. After all, finally, after all these years of George Bush, you know, we finally have taken our country back, right? Everybody was so optimistic. All of these Obama supporters have now been let down. You don't think these people who are voting for Bernie Sanders were enthusiastic Obama voters four years ago and even more so eight years ago? Then why aren't they going for his secretary of state? Why aren't they going for four more years of Obama? Because the last thing they want is four more years of Obama. Now, they're not desperate enough to try the Republicans, but Sanders is so far out of the mainstream of even the Democratic Party that for frustrated Democrats, he's their candidate. And they're only frustrated because the economy stinks, because everything Obama is saying about how great the economy is a lie, and the Bernie Sanders voters know it. And that's the same thing on the Republican side, because the economy is lousy under Obama. We all know that. But, it, but look, but it was lousy under Bush. Bush was a disaster. And so people don't want to go back to Bush. They want to go forward to something different. And the most different candidate in the race is Trump. And Trump, more so than than Cruz, is talking about how bad things are. I mean, Cruz talks about it, too, but not uh, the way Trump does and probably not as believable of a solution, even though I think if you actually listen to what Cruz says, I mean, he has some solutions that will work. I mean, he doesn't want to really acknowledge either what has to be done. Nobody wants to acknowledge this bitter tasting medicine that we've got to swallow because we're going to have to swallow it in order for any of the, the cures to work. But, you know, all this is politically toxic, so no one wants to talk about what has to happen. What's so appealing about Trump is that he talks about all the problems and then he offers a gimmick, quick fix solution, kind of like a painless a miracle cure uh, to the disease without talking about what really needs to be done. So he is getting the fed up, disgruntled voters who don't want to don't want four more years of Obama, but don't want to go back to Bush. They also want to go forward to something different. And they see that in, in Donald Trump. But all of this shows that the economy is in lousy shape. And it doesn't matter what the Federal Reserve says. It doesn't matter what the president says. It doesn't matter what Wall Street says. Look at what the people who are actually living in this economy have to say. And, you know, I don't necessarily trust the people to pick the best president. Their judgment not, might not be good, but I trust them to understand their own circumstances. People know if their lives are getting better or their lives are getting worse, right? I believe the people who are living their lives more than people who are uh, trying to micromanage their lives, uh, you know, from Washington, D.C. So if the people actually living in the economy, they're the ones that are saying how lousy it is. And it is, right? Look, home ownership, 50-year low. Look at the charts. You know, rents going straight up. So people have lost their homes, and every year their rent goes up. Their health care insurance, health costs are rising. Nobody wants to spend money on health care. You hope you don't spend any money on health care. You want to be healthy, but you don't want to spend money on it. You want, you want, to, you want to spend your money on the things that, that, that you enjoy, right? not, not, not staying healthy. So we're spending all this money on health care. We're probably not any healthier, but we're certainly spending more money on it. And the cost of everything is going up. And now, you know, in there was another uh, consumer... A sentiment indicator that came out today. Yeah, it was a Gallup poll 
of kind of consumer confidence. And it was way down. And one of the biggest gripes that people had was rising gas prices. So gas prices have been falling for a couple of years, months and months and months, falling gas prices. And now they're starting to go back up because oil prices now, crude's back around $42 a barrel, and it's going to keep rising. You know, there's some kind of meeting over the weekend. You got uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, you know, talking about some production cups. Maybe they'll actually follow through with it this time. A lot of people are very skeptical that nothing's going to happen. So maybe something will happen because you have a lot of skepticism there. But now the public is actually complaining about rising gas prices. Well, if they're complaining now, imagine what happens when they really start to go up because they're still cheap. But the problem is most Americans are so broke that they counted on that cheap gas. That was the crutch that they needed, and they were limping along on that. And now, all of a sudden, the one thing they had going for them is going in the other direction, and it's already showing up in in these surveys of uh, of sentiment because people are worried about rising gas prices. Well, you know what? They're going to be worrying a lot more because the price of gas is going to go up a lot more, and in fact, so is the price of everything else. We also got some information on consumer prices. That came out this week, and again, you know, up, just 0.1 uh, for the month. They were looking for 0.2. Uh, but still, you know, look at the uh, core, year-over-year core, still up 2.2%. Uh, last month, I think, it was up 2.3%. But still, these core year-over-year price increases are above the Fed's theoretical ceiling of 2%. And we've been above 2% for several months in a row, yet, you know, not a peep out of the Fed, right? The Fed is not, you know, raising up interest rates. But, of course, this is just the government's, you know, doctored up version of the cost of living. I mean, if they're telling us that core prices are rising by 2.2% a year, you better believe they're rising at least twice that much, if not more. And that's another reason why people are upset. Food prices are going up. Utility prices are going up. I mean, the price of almost everything is going up. And now that we've got the dollar going down, and the dollar was still on the defensive until later in the week, and you got a rally in the dollar. So the dollar index, would, which did get below 94, managed to get back above uh, above that handle uh, during the week, and it actually closed around 94.70 or so. I have a feeling that one of the reasons that we got this dollar rally and kind of sell-off in gold was when the Atlanta Fed came out and revised upward that GDP number in the face of worsening economic news, maybe a cause some people to be more optimistic, to think, aha, you know, I guess uh, things are turning around. You know, maybe we've bottomed out, even though they only went up from 0.1 to 0.3. It was the first time that they had revised uh, that estimate upward in, I don't know, maybe a month or so, because it had been just down, 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 down. And then all of a sudden, they uh, they went the other way. So maybe that created some type of some type of confidence. Also, probably the strength in the stock market uh, might, have, uh, might have done that. But people forget, if the stock market is strong, well, maybe the Fed will raise rates. Now, I don't think they will, uh, but a weak stock market means that the Fed can't raise rates because if the stock market is weakening, they, then they've already said they don't want to raise rates when the financial conditions are, are tightening. They, they don't want uh, to do that unless the market is blessing it. Again, that's why I think they did the rate hike uh, last time because the market had been going up, and so the Fed was kind of lulled into this false sense of confidence, which uh, they bit on that, and that was a mistake. And they raised rates, and then the market tanked. But they don't want that repeated. I mean, that January February experience was horrific. They don't want that to happen again, and they certainly don't want it happening closer to the election. Even now, even during the primary, this is still key. They still have to make sure that Hillary Clinton gets the nomination and any kind of economic problems that might surface uh, between now and then are going to work to the benefit of Bernie Sanders. So they certainly want to keep this going through the primaries. They want to make sure that they coronate Hillary, but then they want to make sure she wins. And that's where they're really caught between this rock and a hard place, because how do you stimulate the economy without admitting that it needs the stimulus? Because if they have to cut rates or they have to do QE4, that's an admission that the economy isn't strong. Now, I've, I've speculated that they'll try to blame it on global economy and try to you know, kind of say they're having to do this for the global economy. But I don't really know how that's going to fly. So I do think that there is some pressure on the Fed not to cut rates or not, and not to do QE4 before the election. They'll clearly do it after because then, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're going to have no choice as far as they're concerned. But if the economy really, really is this weak 
I mean, if we get a negative GDP for the first quarter, and as I said on my podcast on Monday, I think the second quarter is going to be weaker than the first because this is the mirror image of the last two years where we have the warmest winter in 120 years or whatever. And so, you know, we, we didn't pull forward any anything from the second quarter. We pulled it out of the second quarter. Right? We didn't push it over there. And you've got the inventory meltdown. You've got the uh, the trade deficit worsening. So all the indications are that as bad as the first quarter was, the second quarter could be even worse. And so if the first quarter is negative and the second quarter is worse, well, then we're obviously in a recession. And if we get information by July that confirms the U.S. economy is in a recession, I don't see how the Fed sits back on its hands through the election in a recession and does absolutely nothing about it. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.